been called the most important case ever tried in El Paso. Good evening. I'm Carrie Matson. Erica Castillo has the night off. I'm Nick Miller. The family of a Maquila worker killed seven years ago is settled out of court today with the company their daughter worked for. News Channel Line's Eric Pearson has been following the case and joins us live now. Eric, just why is this being called such a, a groundbreaking case? Well, this is more than just a regular simple civil trial, Nick. This is the first time someone from another country has sued a uh, United States multinational corporation in U.S. courts. Not only that, but it brings up a bit, an important issue. Are U.S. companies operating abroad using different safety standards for different countries? Now, Cher says this settlement is far-reaching from a business point of view. Cher says that this ends the double standard, or it could end the double standard, that companies use abroad, making them more accountable from safety standards and accountability in any country they choose. Uh, Cher says those kind of standards have been neglected in the past. We had trouble reaching Conoco's attorney for comment today. Today the Insider Exclusive goes behind the headlines in worker safety, U.S. corporate responsibilities to examine how Jim Cher and Sam Legate, partners at Cher and Legate, successfully set a new legal precedent requiring multinational corporations to provide Mexican workers with the same work safety standards and with the same respect, dignity, and protection by the company, whether they make $35 a week or $1,000 a week. They expose the double standard that multinational companies have for the safety of their workers. All workers are entitled to and should demand safe working conditions. This case asks an American court to hold a U.S. company equally responsible for the management decisions which directly affect the lives of Mexican workers. And that's what this case is all about. Most lawyers didn't want to pursue litigation because they thought it was too difficult a case to win. But this was personal for Jim and Sam. Jim and Sam have earned the highest respect from citizens and lawyers alike as two of the best trial lawyers in El Paso, in Texas, and in the nation. And because of that, they are driven to fight for people who have been harmed by the willful or negligent actions of others. Their goal is not only to get justice for their clients, but to make sure that similar incidents don't ever happen again. Hi, I'm Steve Murphy, and this is the Insider Exclusive, live from El Paso, Texas. my great pleasure to introduce Jim Scher and Sam Legate to the show. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Tell our audience a little bit about the type of law that your firm practices. Our firm is a victim's rights firm. We re represent people who would never have access to the legal system unless lawyers like us undertook their case for them and when to you give say, them justice. And when you say never have access, normally people think that you have to pay a lawyer in order for them to represent you. But you take cases on contingency, meaning that if it's, if it's a case you take on, if you lose the case, you don't get paid anything. But if you win it, obviously, it's my great pleasure to introduce Jim Scher and Sam Legate yes, to the show. Welcome to the show, um, guys. There are many types of Tell our audience a little bit about the type of law that your firm practices. Go ahead, Tom. Well, because we get to help the little guy. And it's a lot more satisfying. Probably most people go into law thinking they're going to help somebody, yeah. a person, not a big corporation or, you know. And so it's very, say, very satisfying. And when you say never have access, normally people think just to know that, that you have the to person pay a lawyer is better off in order for at the end of it you. than at the beginning. Mm -hmm. But you take and cases on contingency, we have a case meaning that if it's, if it's a case you take on, if you lose the case, you don't get paid anything. But if you win it, obviously, you know, you're going to be paid, you know, whatever you've agreed to, correct? Yes, sir. Um, there are many types of law. This is probably one of the most important cases we've handled. Lorena, Lorena Mendoza was an employee who went to work for a U.S. company in, in Ciudad Juarez. She went there because she wanted to work for a U.S. company. She found that it would be a future for her. She was hired as an accountant. Well. The company, Contico, chose, they had a huge facility in Ciudad Juarez, and, but they found that Delphi was coming in, taking their employees. Mm -hmm. Contico was paying we have a $24 today, a week uh, to the employees for 48 hours work week. It's a Delphi case was paying a little more, so they were losing employees. 
put at risk. Contico chose to find a community where they could control the workforce. I want you to tell our audience workforce. a little bit about They went to a place case, called yeah. Palomas, Mexico. Palomas is on the border uh, with, with uh, the place that the U.S., uh, Columbus, New Mexico, where Pancho Villa raided into the U.S. It's the only place that had been raided into the U.S. ever at that point. And uh, Contico chose to set up a system for their new employees they hired, by the way, at $22 a week. Instead of paying them, they, they hired 100 people, but instead of paying them with paychecks or using the local bank that was there, Contico decided it was cheaper to send uh, their employees, two of them, a driver and Lorena from Juarez, on the same road in about 90 miles at the same time on the same day of the week delivering cash payroll in a suitcase uh, from Juarez to Palomas. It was an extremely dangerous undertaking as one couldn't imagine. They even instructed Lorena to stick the suitcase, under, the briefcase, underneath her seat as they went through the checkpoints as they were driving from Juarez to Palomas. And everybody knows. Instead of paying them they, they hired a hundred people. Well, as you can imagine, one, one day, uh, Lorena, we discovered this after lengthy work in this case, L Lorena and the driver, their car was stopped on that Friday morning uh, by some vehicles. They were taken out into the desert. Uh, they, the people who took them out there were apparently involved in drug dealing. Uh, they attempted to do something to Lorena. Uh, the driver stepped in. The people shot the driver. They put Lorena and the driver alive in the trunk of the car, poured gasoline over the car, and lit it on fire. And they happened? were burned alive in the trunk of the car. Wow. One, one day, uh, Lorena, we discovered this after lengthy work in this case. Lorena and the driver, their car was stopped on that Friday morning uh, by some vehicles. They were taken out into the desert. Uh, they, the people who took them out there were apparently... Well, it was a very difficult case. There was a little bit of precedent before that, but the evidentiary proof to prove up what happened was an extremely difficult undertaking to get evidence in a foreign country. And then what laws should apply? The first have an argument was, well, this should all be done in Mexico. Right. You know, Mexican law mm -hmm. should apply. Well, of course, under Mexican law, there's no recovery for wow. the family whose daughter was horrible. burned alive. Nothing. When you first heard of this case, so of course, going to keep a, it in we were Mexico. About some of the we brought the suit here in the United States. This is kind of a difficult yeah, case ground. because what never before. Well, had the US legal theory is very similar to the concept of if you shoot a rocket from the United States into Mexico and it kills someone in Mexico, well, the tort or the, the wrongdoing took place in the United States. Yeah. And the evidentiary proof to prove up what happened was an extremely difficult undertaking right. by yeah. an American yeah. foreign country. And, and then what laws should apply? The first argument was... Well, this right, there was an uh, right. uh, armored car that went every day to the bank from Juarez to Palomas and could easily have taken the payroll. They just didn't want to pay the money. There was even a branch so, of the bank of right there. Right. Them, right? Right. right, and that's what the armored car did every day. Yeah. He would take money to and from the bank yeah, over there in Palomas. And, and they could have just price. had an account at the bank, obviously, and walked across the street and done their payroll that way. Now, there's a rocket from the United States into Mexico. And uh -huh. it's it's Tour, right, but it, you know, we're very lucky because things come the into the office that aren't right, in this case was and uh, we've been very fortunate by an American uh, company in that we had the economic to resources to take it on. Harm's yeah. way. To hire when uh, the law professor down at UT to come down, the, the guy who wrote Conflicts of Law, to come educate our court here, 
on uh, the, why it was appropriate to bring the case here to hire P. Palmer, who you, I believe you're going to talk to, an ex-CIA director from Mexico, mm -hmm. to be an expert about what goes on in Mexico. Also, I think mm -hmm. after the CIA, he had Now, there's, a not, there's right. not a lot of law firms that are taking on a case like companies, this, right? Companies about I mean, this is a difficult case to prove. Their employees and what kind of safety they you know, have, right? In Mexico, exactly. Well, in other office, countries, too. Right? This, this case to me brought up this issue. And uh, we've been very fortunate uh, in that we have the economic resources to take it on. Yeah. To hire yes, sir. Uh, they the think law professor value. down at UT to come down, the, the guy who wrote Conflicts of Law, to come educate our What court. makes a human being less valuable because they live ac across a man-made boundary? Mm -hmm. That human being yes. is, is valuable is as important to that family as they are to anyone in this country. As a result, also, I think after the CIA, he had his own private security firms right. who he was advising foreign companies well, about... there is now legal precedent in the United States kind of that can make a U.S. company responsible right. for actions, wrongdoings this, this they do in foreign This case brought up this issue about a double standard that even after your case still exists with a lot of American corporations, right? Yes, sir. Where they think the value of a foreign national is less than an American worker. That's not right, is it? What makes a human being less valuable because they live across a man-made boundary? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That human being is as valuable as is important to that family as they are to anyone in this country. As a result of this case, It is my great pleasure to introduce Pete Palmer to the show. Welcome to the show, Pete. Thanks so much. You have a very interesting background. You work for the CIA. You were primarily in Mexico, right? No, all over Latin America. All over Latin America. And you have a great deal of experience working with the local people. It is my great pleasure to introduce Pete Palmer to the show. Welcome to the show, Pete. Thanks so much. You have a very interesting background. You work for the CIA. You were primarily in Mexico, right? No, all over Latin America. All over Latin America. And you have a great deal of experience working with the local people as well as companies and the government and that sort of thing. Tell our audience, share with our audience a little bit about sure. the, uh, the security The biggest thing that occurs to me is that I derived from the CIA that had applicability share with our to keeping people safe, which after all was the objective, or try to keep people safe uh, before problems CIA occur rather than deal with companies know what after they be doing bad things have happened as in, in the Mendoza case. case. Uh, but the biggie is I think that in the uh, espionage world, your main commitment is to keeping your asset agent safe. And so how do you keep them safe? Well, you don't behave stupidly. You feel what's around you, you sense what's around you, you sense danger, okay, and then you abort the meeting. You, uh, you behave appropriately so as to not lead whoever may be watching you uh, to discover who you're, who you're seeing or who you're protecting. This had direct apl applicability to the crime situation someplace like Mexico City or Bogota or uh, almost anywhere in Latin America where the criminals are out there and they're going to go after somebody. So you can't stop them from behaving that way, but hopefully you get them to go after Jim instead of me. Okay, uh, so the whole behavior process is if you behave in a certain kind of way, you'll dissuade them because you, you can reduce the element of surprise. You'll let them know that you see them. And once they know that you see them, they're likely to go after somebody else because they don't really care whether it's you or Jim or, or me. They just want somebody that's going to give them some of what they want. And the other big thing that I did uh, was I started databasing when I started the business. I started keeping track of cri every crime I could find out about, which was mainly, mainly reading all the newspapers that were published in Mexico on a regular basis, and databasing all kinds of crime. Mm -hmm. Nobody in Mexico was doing that. So all of a sudden, I became the, the wise one because I actually knew stuff. No, not at all. Not at all. They were Police, sadly, in many instances, are part of the problem rather than part of the solution. So they weren't necessarily after solving things or precluding them, where that was, of course, what I want to do is, A, preclude it, and if I couldn't preclude it, then try to help people fix it. 
No, not at all. Not at all. They were police, sadly, in many instances, are part of the problem rather than part of the solution. Mm -hmm. So they weren't necessarily. You gain a sense. You gain a sense of who is likely to have committed it. Okay. Uh, do you prove it? No. Uh, frequently, I found myself uh, so following up after a truck hijacking, you know, interviewing the truck driver, types of crimes, and I knew he was lying to me. I didn't know if he was lying about something that mattered to me or something that mattered to him. Just the, the behavior mm -hmm. part of it, you just pick up on, you know, the, you know, looking at the right and the left and all the stuff that you've read about uh, in terms of body language. Well, that's there. Uh, and then you start realizing that they're, 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 they're breaking their fluidity and what they're saying to you. And there's something wrong. You don't know necessarily what's wrong. You find it when you're, when you're dealing with somebody in the stand, I'm sure. And you, you, you know something's wrong. You may or may not, it may not be important to you, important to him. They're breaking their fluidity and what they're saying to you. And there's something wrong. You don't know necessarily what's wrong, you find it when you're, when you're dealing with somebody in the stand, I'm sure. And you, get, you, you know something's wrong. Right. You may mm -hmm. or may not, it may not be important to you, important to him. Companies operating in Mexico today, say American companies, it would do them a lot of good to hire someone well, like Well, I think that many of them, I have a lot of so my uh, clients in Mexico were multinational, and, and, and the vast majority really of them, I think, the behave on, responsibly. Other there was obviously going to be a, a, in a case like this, the, the Mendoza case, now are was grotesque, for their actions uh, gro in grotesque in terms of well, irresponsibility, grotesque in terms of respect of life. That respect of caring about somebody that's uh, yeah. so far down the tote pole. Is that some responsibly? Uh, there is obviously going to be a, in a case like this, the, the Mendoza case, it was grotesque. Uh, gr grotesque in terms of irresponsible. Well, oh, I didn't try to teach them ethics, no. But what I did try to do was set up uh, systems for them that would keep people and products safe. Is that something that you if I'm keeping products safe, I'm keeping people safe. If I'm keeping money safe, I'm keeping the people carry it safe. To try and respect the $35 a week worker as well as your corporate well, executive. I didn't try to teach them ethics, no. Yeah. But what I did try to do was set uh, I would say it's safe to do business, but you have to exercise prudence. Uh, bromidly, I say, don't check your common yeah. sense in the airplane. Yeah. Bring it with you. Yeah. Uh, the yeah. same As wisdom that helps you walk New York or, or Atlanta or any other major metropolitan area, some of those same skill sets have applicability there. What I found oftentimes is that that Hispanics would work for a multinational and think, oh, I'm, I disappear here. I don't exist. I'm not a, I'm not a threat. I'm not a problem. And virtually all of them got held up or assaulted one time or another. Yeah. Have applicability there. What I found oftentimes is that uh, Pete Palmer, former director of CIA in Mexico and Central America, was very, very critical on the case. I'm not a problem. And virtually all of them got. Up yeah. He said Jim, what the standards are the for them and what they should have done wasn't it? Uh, with the evidence of what they didn't do and yes. how bad it was. It was very, very wonderful to have somebody with uh, Mr. Palmer's credentials testify and exactly speaking on what, what the standards are and, and what they sh should have done. What the standards well. are for them mm -hmm. and what they should have done. Uh, yeah. Uh, with the evidence of what they didn't do and yes. how bad it was. This man is re really special. This man picked up on this case when other people didn't see it. This man pursued it. And uh, so it was an honor to work the case. Uh, it, it was so predictable. What happened was so predictable that it was would make you cry. Uh, but this man was the one that, cho that chose, uh, pursued it, and I got, to, I got to play. This man picked up on this case when other Thank people didn't see it. Thank you. What a case. What I like most about this case is you took on a case that most lawyers wouldn't handle. I mean, think about it, different jurisdictions and they're gonna try their best to say it's not our problem, right? But you set a standard and that's what I admire about the work. What a case. What I like most about this case is you took oh, on a case that most lawyers wouldn't handle. I mean, think about it, different jurisdictions, and they're, they're going to try their best to say it's not a problem, right? But you said standard. standard.
and, and that's what, that's what I, I admire, admire about, about the work, work that you did in this particular case. case. And, and it comes right back to taking care, care of the little guy, right? right? Lorena, Lorena, Lorena Mendoza. Mendoza. How did you, How get, did you get this case, case in, the in the beginning, by the way? Lorena's sister identified mm -hmm. her remains. Mm -hmm. She's a medical doctor, and she's highly respected in, in, in Mexico, helping the Tahumara Indians for free. Yeah. She sought legal no. counsel all over the country. country. No one took the case. She came she in and talked with us. with us and asked if we could just please help find out what happened to her, her sister because the company told her they didn't know what happened. And at that time, you didn't even know whether you would have a case, right? Because right? you, you, you didn't really know the facts, did you? Thanks for joining us. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at InsiderExclusive.com.